Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizers to have invited me to be there today. It's a great pleasure to be able to, to be in this historical place and share some uh, of the results we've got in with, with our team. And thank you for that. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, aurorin, tugenensis, that we found in 2000. And I would like to present uh, the last work, not only physical anatomical work, but also the environment work. So uh, when we began our work in the late 90s, invited by the Kenyan government to work in the Tugan Hills, the, the general pattern in human evolution would say that man was born in Savannah and bipedalism would have, been appeared, would have appeared in Savannah. Divergence between chimpanzees and humans took place between four to six million years. The common ancestor would have been chimp-like and he would have uh, walked like a chimpanzee and knuckle walking uh, deplacement. And actually in 2001, uh, um, uh, in a book about Bonobo, um, a paper was written by Richard Rangham and David Pilbeam, stipulating that six million years old ancestor would have been the fin and amol, knuckle walking, and females would have had body coats. And from fossils, it's very difficult to, to identify that. But in these days, we were also um, diving in this uh, linear evolution of humans, which is actually a kind of contradiction in terms of evolution, because most mammals actually expand diverge. We have a lot of bushy evolution with mammals. So why do man be different, in a sense? And we have been addressing this problem in the Tugan Hills. So the Tugan Hills is, a, is in East Africa, in Kenya, in the main rift. And it's in this, uh, oops, where you got the star, it's uh, Lake Baringo, which is the main Gregory Rift. Uh, this is a general pattern view of going down from the top of the hills down to the Baringo Lake, that you can see in the, in the background. If I, uh, oops, uh, oops, yeah, okay, well, there. And all you can see in white and red on the picture is, are basically uh, fossiliferous deposits, full, full of fossils. The first fossil, interesting, the first uh, hominid found in the area was found by Martin Pickford, which is in the audience, who is in the audience today. And he found the specimen in 1974 when he was doing his PhD in the area. And he collected the tooth, which was known in the circles as the Lucano tooth, because it came from the Lucano formation. And this tooth has been uh, very much discussed. And it, it was put in hominids, in chimpanzees, drought signs. It went all the systematical aspects of, uh, uh, of uh, evolu evolutionary pattern. And unfortunately, it was found the year Lucy was found. So a tooth against a skeleton, it didn't make a, a nice career as Lucy. But we were when we were invited by the government uh, of Kenya to go back to this area, we actually managed to prospect this uh, uh, on the right side, the top pictures on the right, the Lucano formation. And in 2000, in October 2000, uh, unfortunately, we were stuck at the Kenyan border, Ugandan Kenyan border, and our workers were waiting for us, and they began to survey the area. And this is Kiptelap Cheboy, who found the first specimen of a new uh, collection, and which shows a mandible in two pieces, left side and right side. Later on, we found the, the symphysis. In terms of stratigraphy and dating, in the Tugan Hills, we have a deposit from 18 million years up to now. And all sedimentary, all this sedimentary sequence is an inter, interrupted by, by lava flows and volcanics. And so you can follow up the evolution of humans and environment step by step from 18 million years up to now. So this is a, a really a wonderful area. So we managed actually to focus on the Lucania formation, which has been dated to 6 million years. Uh, First of all, by Martin in the 70s on the biochronology, and then later on by Android and his team, and by Sawada and his team, and the new datations we did, uh, including Paleomag. 
So basically, we have a nice se se sequence with, uh, which is overlays, over, overlay, sorry, overlay uh, some uh, trachytes, a lava flow, and which is overlain by a series of basalts. Inside, you get several uh, lava flows which have been dated. So all the sites have been really clearly um, put in the, in the pattern of uh, time. This is a general picture of the Lucone formation. On the hill on the right, this is, these are the Caparina basalts. Then you get uh, seals, uh, tuffs, and you get a lot of uh, silty clays. And we don't see the base of the sequence at that specific site, uh, but the, you would get the trachyte at the base. So it's a wonderful place to work. Even you are not a geologist, you can actually see properly that you have slopes, you have bending, you have, you have volcanics, and it's a really clear, well, more or less clear area to work there. Uh, Aurorin was found in four sites, four main sites. Cheboit was the first site uh, where Martin Pickford worked in 1974. And we found three more sites in 2000. We found the first mandible, as I show you, as I showed you, sorry, was found at Capsomine. Um, there was a phalanx found at Cap Chiberec, and there was also a piece of femur found at Aragai. All of them coming from the Lucaino formation. 99% uh, of the material comes from Capsimine ravine, and this is a map of, uh, of a trench, not a trench, a ravine itself here. And I'm sorry, it's a bit too small on the screen. Uh, but what you can see in the main ravine, you get a lot of numbers, and these are all the specimens found in this very specific spot. And several of the specimens fit together. We could re-glue them reconstruct them, and we got also postcranial found in situ. So we have uh, several individuals there because we know we have two left femurs. So first of all, two left femurs means that you have two individuals. Then you get old, uh, anim old uh, specimen and younger ones. And if you look carefully on the left, you see a number here on the left. This is another ravine. And as far as I know, uh, we don't have fossil jumping from one ravine to another one with a slope in between, with a hill in between. So we probably have another deposit on the left, but we didn't find anything else at the moment. So we, at that side, we may have four to five individuals. Then you get Cap Chevrolet site and Aragai site. So it means quite a few animals, even if the, if the material is not um, so uh, numerous in number. So Aurorin, this is Aurorin on the left and uh, left side, the main picture here. It's what we knew in 2000. This is his picture here. And uh, then later on, we found the, the symphysis. We got several isolated teeth, and we found some more postcranial. And basically, which is interesting, I'm not going to comment everything because it will be probably too long, and I want to address some other aspects of the thing. But uh, the thing is, the, the canine, the, 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 the lower can the upper canine, sorry, it's quite small, and um, it's, for, it's a female, and the honing facet is very small, very tiny. And the same is true on the lower canine, which is a male canine, and on that canine, it's, again, we know that the, the, the honing facet is very, very tiny at the top, and we know that there was no diastema because there was a small facet, unfortunately, just at the base of the crown, which is a facet of contact with the lower P3. So there was no diastema, diastema and the, fat, the face was relatively flat. Uh, this is also proved by the symphysis here, because on the uh, mesial side, uh, the distal side, sorry, of the symphysis, we could see the roots of a, P, of a P3. Uh, on the left, lower, lower left uh, pictures, I've been putting here the mandibles as a whole, the contact is there between the symphysis and the left branch of the mandible. But to avoid any mis, um, uh, or misreconstruction, because we, the angulation might be a little bit tiny, different, uh, I just didn't stack all the specimen together. But we have here the mandible. An aspect which is quite interesting is the upper molars. We have here the three molars, the M1, M2, M3. This is Aurorin, and on the right-hand side, it's chimpanzee. 
And interestingly enough, um, when you look at the wear pattern on the teeth, the first molar is very worn in uh, Aurin and the chimpanzee. The second molar is not worn in the, don't see, you don't see the, the, the dentina coming out in Aurin, but you see it in, uh, in chimpanzees. And the same is true from the third molar. This is not worn, but it's worn in chimpanzees. So that means if the first molar is very worn and the two other molars are not in Aurin, but the three molars are worn together in chimpanzees, that means that three teeth have been function, did function on the same time in, in chimpanzees, but in Aurin, the first molar erupted and you have to wait a long time until the second and then the third molar erupted. So you have a delay in the, in the growing pattern of Aurin. And this is what we see usually in Australopithecines and hominids. So it was a very interesting uh, feature. Uh, a basic uh, work done with um, the, the length of the lower molar row compared to the incisor molar and molar row, the comparison between the two, showed a very interesting pattern. Is actually that uh, you get, okay, chimpanzees, gorillas, pongos, and so on, but what you get Australopithecus afarensis here. Oops, you see the two letters here, and Aurorin falls towards the Homo sapiens, of Homo as a whole, and also near the Australopithecines. Nothing to do with Paranthropus or uh, only a bit far away from Australopithecus afarensis. So this was one of the reasons we, we used to say that it's probably not an Australopithecines because it doesn't fit in terms of proportions in the, in the dental uh, proportions. But um, if we move to the femur, and I will come back to that later anyway. If we move to the, the postcranial, the postcranial, we got two femurs, two nice femurs, uh, w both from, oops. Oops, I don't know what happened, anyway. Uh, the two left top pictures from the two femurs uh, found in situ at Scapsomine. Obviously, one is quite old, uh, quite robust, and the other one, which is the best preserve, is actually a young adult, the age of Lucy, in terms of maturation of bone. Um, when you compare it with the chimpanzee, as we did on the right side, on the top, the chimpanzee is on the left, or is on the right. And I remember when we published the first time, when we announced the discovery of a female, of a bipedal animal, uh, a, a colleague from America gave an interview to science and he said, I swear this is a chimpanzee. Well, I'm not so convinced about that and uh, now, hopefully, uh, thanks to, to God, if I may say so in this area, uh, that actually a lot of works have been done by other colleagues on the same material and they came to the same conclusion. This is not a chimpanzee, this is a hominid. And uh, basically in the next structure, in the position of um, of, uh, of uh, lower trochanter, and also the length of the bone. For the bone which is about the same size of Lucy uh, of a, on the left of, um, of chimpanzee, you see that the bone is much shorter. You don't reach here the extension that you got near the knee. So for an animal which is about the same size as chimpanzee, it's much longer in a sense, and this is a a nice um, feature and a feature which is used usually to work on bipedalism. Uh, the other thing is we did a, a CT scan and on the, on, the, on the neck it's clear that you get the cortical thickness of a bone which is thicker at the bottom of, an, of the neck and much thinner on the top. And again, this is one feature which has been related. Although you can find some exception in primates, but it's basically a marker of bipedalism because you support the weight of your body and you have to reinforce the, the arch of the femur. Uh, the humerus is very fragmentary. It tells us that it was basically a climber. So climbing and bipod, but bipedal animal that we knew from Lucy and Australopithecines, so it's not new. It's a good uh, pattern for an ancestor. We got a phalanx from the last digit, the first, phalanx, the first phalanx of the fifth digit, which is very curved and shows that basically it was probably capable of climbing trees. 
And we got a very interesting phalanx that we work with Dominic Gomori, who is in the audience as well. And on the left, this is Aurorin here. On the right, in the middle picture, you get an ostrap with a sign. And at far end, you get a human uh, with a blue back here. And obviously, uh, Aurorin showed the pattern that you get in hominids. When we come back to the work done on Stroopife signs by Bill, um, not Bill Jungers, uh, Randy Sussman in the 70s, all the features described by, by Randy on the phalanx were there. But his conclusions were that in Stroopife signs, it could also prove that Stroopife signs used their thumb for manipulating tools or making tools. And we, with Dominic, when we thought about that, said, no, it's not possible because we're six million years old and tools were not there. So we, we reworked that, we restudied the, 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 the features in a large uh, primate uh, collection. And actually our suggestion is that this pattern doesn't relate to how you manipulate tools, but how you have a very thin, precise way of, of um, it's a precise grip, actually which you would need when you climb trees because you have not the same proportion as chimpanzee, you don't have the same proportion as a human. So you have a middle size, I would say. And if you have to climb trees, you have to really assure that you're not going to fall. And this precision grip, as we call it, is probably a pre-adaptation pre pre or exaptation, as we say in biology, which actually this precision grip, which was useful for climbing for this kind of animal, could have been used later on, and it was facilitating the tool manipulation in a later species. Um, some people have said that uh, Aurorin was an Ostroapifes sign. Um, I'm not so sure today, but we can talk about that. In terms of, uh, of uh, measurements, um, it's clearly smaller than Asparensis. In terms of femurs, the, the neck, the length of the neck, the shape of the, of, um, of the head, and the, uh, the lower trochanter don't fit in a Australopithecus sign pattern for the moment. Plus, when we compared it with Lucy, Lucy has his head just going back, a little bit backwards, but the head in Aurorin, bigger, is oriented more forward. So it seems that we have a different complex in terms of morphology of walking. So because of these differences in, in teeth and differences in postcranial, we think that it's, it's, um, it's a good idea to have a new genus, and that's what we call it Aurorin uh, tugenensis. In terms of environment, it's very diverse. Uh, we have a lot of f f fossil leaves. Oops, sorry. And these fossil leaves. Oops, sorry, sorry. And these fossil leaves tell us that we have um, a, a dry Sempervian forest. But dry Sempervian forest means that you have green trees all year long, and the animal can actually feed on, on fruits all year long. But we have also leaves with long, long um, dripping points. So if you have these long dripping points in these leaves, that means that you have m more water and you have patches with very deep forest. We got actually uh, water chevrotin that have been found in terms of fossils. We got peak, for, uh, we get uh, forest peak, we get uh, a lot of um, impalas, and impalas are basically not in open savanna, but in a more bushy savanna. And we get also a lot of colobine monkeys, and colobine monkeys usually live in trees. So you have probably patches with uh, a kind of um, a bushy savanna and places with more deep forest. Preserved. We also found a lot of, um, of limestone deposits which are related uh, with uh, calcification and when the, the, the uh, basic pH of the water there, and uh, which ex is explained also uh, by the presence of geysers as we have in uh, Bogoria Lake today, and uh, where we experience exactly the same thing today. In terms of, uh, sorry, I thought which screen would be bigger, but anyway. Uh, we did quite a lot of work in terms of geochemistry as well, and we identified in the pattern three major uh, uh, phosphate uh, uh, levels, and these phosphates are full 
of diatomites. And this diatomite, this specific diatomite, gives you an idea about the pH, which is a basic pH, about 7.2, 7.8 uh, in terms of pH of the water. So we, are no, we have not acid waters at all. Uh, but on the other hand, this, um, uh, the geochemistry showed that, that you had a lot of input from the slopes of the of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of mountains, of the hills outside, which acts a big impact, which is done when you have a lot of water, a lot of rain coming. So it was basically, you have, we are sure that some places that you have a lot of, of washing water uh, around. In terms of uh, delta C free, uh, delta C free um, um, diet, uh, we have animals there with the large herbivores, the large mammals tell us that we have a mixture of uh, C3, C4 plants, which means people, pe not people, the elephants or pigs or whatever, we are feeding on uh, C3 like leaves, but also on uh, grass as well. So it's a mixed pattern, not an open savanna. Uh, coming to locomotion, uh, we, from time to time, I don't know if it's the same in Italy, but in France I've been seeing that a lot, and in some papers as well, scientific papers, but bipedalism is not a good feature to define hominids, uh, because all primates are biped. It is true, all primates are biped. But man is the only primate who can walk on long distance for a long time and who is energetically positive, I would say. So it is a very, very, very clear pattern. Uh, the form in magnum has been used as well in terms of look for recognizing locomotion. The thing is, um, I've been reading a lot of new papers on the pattern uh, from Spanish people, American, British people, and they all point out today that the position and orientation of a, of a, of a foramen is not only related to locomotion, but also to brain expansion and face uh, movement growing pattern. So at the moment, um, the papers done on primates are more cautious about the study of and use of uh, Farman Magnum to define locomotion. So we're in the state that today we have three major hominids, pseudo-hominids, what hominids, uh, on, in the same time period, more or less between 6 and 5.2 million years. Aurorin on the left, to my in the top right, Salanthropus and Ardipithecus. Um, I think we, it's difficult to compare all of them together because we don't have the same things uh, preserved. Uh, but in terms of locomotion and skeleton, um, we have good evidence for Aurorin at the moment. We are still waiting for Silentropus, hopefully in the future. And in Ardipithecus uh, cadaba, my concern is the only one phalanx. The humerus is clearly an arboreal animal, and the, uh, the foot phalanx is, um, is very much curved and also uh, shows uh, the, the pattern of uh, the climbing trees at the moment. So we need more and more material. And unless we don't get more dental and more postcranial material, it will be difficult to actually settle the problem of, uh, of, um, of, uh, of the earliest hominid. Um, Ardipithecus ramidus, um, sorry, to, I hope you'll, get some, you'll say something about that, um, dear colleague. <laughs> um, it has been told to be one of the oldest uh, hominid. And I'm still puzzled because on the skeleton, we don't have a knee, we don't have a, ankle, we don't have a hip, and we don't have a, the, the, the arm preserved. So in terms of proportion, I'm still a little bit cautious about that, but we can discuss that later. Um, in terms of systematics, and Michel sp was pointing out uh, earlier, uh, and I think he would agree with me on that, that uh, some colleagues have proposed that Cernanthropus, Aurin, and Ardipicus would be the same genus. And from dental morphology or postcranial morphology, I wouldn't accept that at the moment. I think it's better to leave the three different genera uh, aside for the moment. Um, now to, to, to complete, I would like to talk a little bit of environment uh, because we talk about climbing, climbing trees. Trees is really a factor of evolution, very important factor of evolution in our history. And if we look at, well, which is difficult, it is a savanna reconstruction, I would say on the bottom right. But savanna is a world by itself. You have a wooded savanna, deep wooded savanna, less wooded savanna, almost desertic savanna. So what kind of environment are we talking when we're talking about, uh, about uh, earliest hominids? 
And working through Africa with a team for many years, um, a specific environment uh, was very um, challenging for us. This is the Miombo forest. Here you get the savanna, fever tree savanna, the open savanna, the brassus tree savanna. But the Miombo is a kind of savanna which can be uh, very much weeded. We know wet Miombo, we know dry Miombo, and this this, uh, this is important because when you talk about locomotion, it's not only the capacity, anatomical capacity, but it's also the kind of trees you climb on. Is it a straight tree, a bended tree, is it a large tree? It's what we don't know. And uh, one, one aspect which has been actually forgotten for many years is the structure, the physiognomy itself of a savanna of a tree. And in a Myombo, it's interesting because you get that, oops, again. It's the trees, the trunks are vertical. The, the trees can go up to 18 meters tall, even more sometimes, sometimes smaller. And in terms of walking, it's interesting because you can walk up, you climb up vertically to the tree. And in terms of evolution, it can be interesting because this Myombo, which is nowadays re reduced to the southern part of Africa, up to Tanzania actually, well, it was in the past recorded by, um, by um, my colleague working in Paris in France. Uh, I forgot her name. It's terrible. Oh, Raymond Bonfi, sorry. Uh, Raymond recorded that uh, Myombo uh, in, the, in Ethiopia 10 million years ago. So that means that this vegetation, which is reduced to Southern Africa today, might have had a larger distribution in the past. So we should actually work more on the structure of this uh, Myombo to understand better what kind of animals and how they move uh, and the impact which could have on, on, on hominid evolution. It's even more important because when you look at the face, everybody would say a flat face is more hominid-like. No, for me it's not. If you look at Sibids, South American primates, they are flat face and they are not hominids. If you look at Colobine, they are flatter face, they are not hominid. But what they do, they are arboreal animals. And actually, if you look at a baboon, which is terrestrial, the face is very long. Colobine, it's very short. But we know in the past, five million years ago in the Tuganese, we know the Paracolobus chemeroni. He has a longer face, and this guy was partly on the soil. So basically, the, the, the flattening of the face is not hominid feature, it's the arboreal feature, which has been actually retained by hominids when they were bipedal in 3D dimension. So it's a suggestion, but, and we can discuss that anyway. Uh, to complete uh, the story, uh, so where did we, origi where did we originate, originate it from? Um, if Copens in 1981 would have said, in, actually in this air, in this room, uh, said it was due to the rift, and then he uh, rejected his hypothesis, and I'm not, I don't agree with him. The theory has to be rejected, but not for all the aspects. The East Side Story is not only a geographic uh, uh, hypothesis, it has a, a component of time and component of ecology. In terms of time, he said, in 1986, and he can actually challenge me on that, but in the Academy of Science, he said the dichotomy was about 10 million years. It's exactly what we've got today. We come back to the same time period today. He said the east of the reef was drier than the left, which is absolutely true. I spent 27 months of my life in these parts of Africa, close to Congo, and all the fauna and flora we've got are from wet environments, and the flora it's very interesting because it, the, the combination the, of these floras are found today in Kasai in, in Congo, in RDC. But at that time, the tropics were much higher, so Western Uganda was very wet. At the same latitude, in Eastern Rift, it was drier, forested, but drier forest. So the rift had a component as well. So I would agree with, with, with Copens, his history is okay for chronology and environment and climate, it's wrong, probably wrong for geography, because it's very difficult on the basis of a fossil species to find the origin in a species which have, by definition, a, a modification in time and space. Uh, now, to, uh, to put that in, in shape, I would say that if we go back to the Miocene, 
uh, on the le bottom, uh, bottom left, we get there in the lower Miocene, and the lower Miocene, Africa was completely tropical, and we get fossils in Northern Africa, East Africa, and Southern Africa. In the middle Miocene, in the top right, um, actually what happened, the Antarctica became bigger, and the, 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 the belt, climatic belt moved upwards. Eurasia became tropical. At the same time, you get a paleogeography movement, which permitted the, 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 to the hominoids to, to spread in Eurasia. That's why you got a lot of fossils in Europe and Asia. By the upper Miocene top left, um, they actually the Arctic took place and displaced suddenly the bells. And I'm almost done. And, uh, and the, the, the Africa became tropical again. So the story is probably not a story of a certain place. It's a story of climatic change. And on that last picture, well, previous last, uh, you get to see a tropical belt. And actually, the origin of the hominids would be probably in this retracting belt between southern Eurasia and top of Namibia. So we have a lot to do. In the, in the So my conclusion will be very quick. Man was born in Savannah, bipedalism appeared in Savannah, no. Uh, different between human took place at four to six million years, no, it's much older, we know that today. Common ancestor of a chimp-like teeth, that's wrong, we know that now from the fossils, and the common ancestor was a knuckle walker, no evidence. But the thing is, we uh, more and more worked on um, on, um, on fossil chimpanzees and gorillas, and we found them today. So we are now actually precising this dichotomy. And the very last picture is uh, data for future, challenging. We found in Southern Africa, semi-form, amongst the oldest in Africa, in Namib Desert. What happened to these anthropoids? We don't know. In the lower Miocene, we get hominoids in South Africa. What happened to them? Did they move to East Africa? Did they move left, uh, eastward, northwards? We don't know, but they are there. They are still there in middle Miocene in Africa and Namibia. Where did they go from? So Southern Africa has to be searched. So it's one point. The second point is that we have nice new myo, myo Pliocene deposit. We found them in Namibia, in the Etosha Basin, so we have a good time period to find for hominids. And we find we have also fauna in Western Rift in, uh, in Uganda. So we have a lot of work to do. So to finish, to conclude, I'm sorry, a bit too long, but I would like to conclude to thanks the team because this adventure was a challenge in terms of science and humans, behaviors and exchange. So thanks to all the team and thanks for your attention.